So getting beyond just simple squashing a signal or holding a vocal in place or gluing things together, you start to think of compression as texture and vibe and movement. You get into compression more as an art form, as a way to manage density and transient and movement. That's when things really start to get fun with compressors. But before you can do that, you gotta learn how to hear it. Welcome to Kush After Hours. My name's Gregory Scott. Tonight I'd like to do something hopefully very different for you than other stuff that you've seen maybe on YouTube and other places, other sources of audio information. I would like to open up a session on a mix that I just finished and solo out the drums and something else for context and then show you how to hear compression specifically on the drum bus. So for those of you who are new to this channel or don't know me at all, and you're wondering, who is this ass clown and why is he gonna teach me how to hear compression? I design compressors and EQs and distortion boxes, both in the analog and the digital world. Kush Audio is my company. All this brown gear back here, these are all my creations. These plugins here, these are all my creations. And I'm also a musician and a composer. I've been doing that for over 20 years. I've been designing this crap for over 10. I'm not here to tell you I'm an authority. I'm not here to tell you that I'm a great mixer, great producer, songwriter, any of that stuff. That's what you think of my art is your business, not mine. But I can tell you that when I reach for a compressor and I adjust the attack from 100 microseconds to 400 microseconds, I can hear that. Now, whether or not you like what I do with that, that's a different question, right? But I can hear it. And I would like for you to be able to hear it too, because the more you can hear these things, by definition, the more options you have for your own productions, whether you're a mixer for hire or an artist doing this in your own bedroom. So there are a few tricks to learning to hear exactly what all these little nuances of compression do. And I'm going to exaggerate to cartoonish levels some of the things that I'm doing. Again, this is because I'm not telling you how to compress things. I just want you to be able to hear exactly what the attack knob does on a compressor. And not just like hearing what it does, but maybe understanding what the textures are, what emotional qualities this brings to your productions. I could yammer on all night about this stuff, but let's get to it. Let's open up some sounds. Just for your edification, this is the sound of the production. That may or may not be to your taste at all, but I think most of you would probably agree that the drums, let me just pull up these drums here and drums on the Rhodes piano. I think most of you would agree that these sound good. They may not be the sound that you want, but they sound good. The high frequencies, they're smooth. They're silky even. That's a trick. I get that sound in large part because it's running out through this gear back here. My drums always go through these first four pieces of gear in the rack. And I'll talk in the future about what my settings are and how I use this stuff and why. But for now, just know these drums are in pretty good shape. So again, the point here is to not show you how to compress these drums. It's to use a good sounding source and bend it so that you can hear what the compressor does and maybe start to get a sense of why you would want to use the various settings on the compressor to achieve emotional textural and movement kind of effects. So let's start off with the attack. And specifically, let's get into the attack and hearing what's called transient control, packing those transients in. Transient is the initial burst of sound on a waveform. So when you hit a cymbal or you hit a drum, that initial of sound is called the transient. And the compressor really gives you an astonishing amount of control over the size and the speed and even the texture and the the tone of that transient. So let's start off here with the drums and I'm gonna bury them inside the roads, meaning I'm gonna turn the drums way down until they're like undermixed inside the roads. And there's, there's a couple of reasons for that, but the main one is that compression, especially shaping the attack, is really easy to hear at low volume. That's true when talking about the source being at a low volume in relation to other sounds in the mix. It's also true with the volume of your mix that you're listening to in the room. So 
here's a little pro tip for you. When you're learning about compression, especially things like mix bus compression or drum bus compression, where you can really whack out a transient, and you're not sure what's going on, turn the volume of your mix in the room that you're listening to. Turn it down so quiet that you can barely hear it. And then play with the attack knob on the compressor on your mix or on the drum bus or both. And you, you should be able to hear at that super quiet volume what that attack knob is doing. That's, that's different than knowing what to do with what you're hearing, but at least the first step is being able to hear this crap. So let's get into the drums here. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dial up some what we call generous compression. speed up the release a little bit here for demonstration purposes. We call this a fast-ish release, uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 milliseconds I consider fast. Let's let all the transient through. Alright, so that's very compressed. We turn this way down. point all you're hearing pretty much is the transient on these drums that initial burst of sound coming through the compressor before it clamps down now I'm gonna speed the attack up and let's just listen to what happens to the sound of the drums sound coming through now. If I go even faster, there's no transient left here, right, compared to this. All right. So that's the first thing that your ear needs to understand with compression is exactly what the attack knob is doing to your transient because a common beginner mistake, we'll call it, is to have too much transient and to overmix it, to mix it too loud in the mix. And so you get these really, it's sort of a viscerally powerful feeling or sounding thing, but what happens is your drums are just too loud in the mix. And when you listen outside of the studio, you lose the power of the music itself. So you got these big, thwacky drums, but Nothing else is really happening in the mix that's interesting and most people don't really care about big thwacky drums. They want to feel the power of the music of the song. So getting an ear for the attack and transient is crucial. And the great way to do that is to turn your sound way down when you're shaping the attack. Right, so I would call this a snappy transient. wacky. It's a very punchy sound. So we start thinking about textures. Attack is a way to shape the punch and the attitude of the sound on the front edge. The brightness, when you let less sound through like that on the initial burst, the sound sounds mellower. shape that for clarity. You can bury a sound deeper in the mix when you have just enough of the right kind of pop coming through on the front edge of the sound. The ear tunes into that and knows the sound exists. And sometimes that's all you need is to just kind of remind the listener the sound exists. It's not the focus, it's not the point, but it's keeping time, it's dancing away in the background, it's doing something. So this is a tool in your toolkit. We've talked about the attack as a form of transient management and punch. Let's talk about it as a texture specifically. Let's turn the sound back up so that we can really hear. And then let's talk about hardness versus softness for a second. Emotionally, this sound here, it's got a it's got a strong, tough feel to it. Right? 
this is projecting strength, weight, authority. This is a soft sound. This sound is now more about the sound is more about the release of the drums, the tail end of the drums, than it is about the attack of the drums. It's a different vibe. It's still got a fat, chunky thing. But this, this draws my attention to the drummer hitting the drum. versus there just being drums in the mix. So again, what you do with this stuff is up to you. But it's just, it's interesting to, to know what's going on and how that translates emotionally. So this, this is softness. You don't have to dig in so hard with the compressor. But you can make a sound tougher smoother and softer with the attack. All right, so let's move on to the release. Release is fun. I mean, release is like, everybody talks about attack and thresholds and ratios and stuff with compressors, but to, to me, release is really, mm, it's, it's hard to hear release, but let's, let's get you hearing it. Let's slow our attack back up and bring our back down. Okay, let's dig back in. And now I'm gonna bury the sound again. Okay, so now what we're gonna focus on is the movement of the high frequencies. And in this case, the high frequencies would be the ride cymbal, primarily. There's a little bit of tickety-tackety from the bongos in there, but we're not going to worry about that right now. Let's just focus on the ride symbol and the movement of it. So if we think of the level being here, and this is quieter, this is louder, what's happening to that ride symbol is that it's ducking very quickly in response to the kick and the snare being grabbed by the compressor. Now you can see this on the activity meter here, the gain reduction meter. This meter is just jamming in response to the kick and the snare, but it's getting back to zero pretty quickly. So the effect that that has on the high frequencies and on the movement of the ride cymbal is kind of a flicker. All right. Listen to what happens when I slow this release way up. got this sort of seasick reverse swelling happening on the cymbals now. So why is this interesting or useful? Let's get into the blend knob. What happens when we take this groove here, this overcompressed seasick groove, and we blend it in parallel? Visit the uncompressed signal. So here the kick and the snare are the loudest things, and the ride cymbal is just kind of ticking away underneath and behind them. Now the drummer's dancing. The kick and the snare sound kind of the same. on them, but by and large, it, but it's the movement of the high frequencies because we got a low parallel blend, about 30% of an overcompressed signal with a lot of swimmy bumpiness on it. It's a cool sound because it changes the groove. It's not really obvious compression. If 
we go back to 100% Blend and go to our fast release flicker, speed up the attack a little bit. Let's put our blend back at 30%. What happens to the groove? Right. So it's not as swimmy, but it's still making the hi-hats dance and the ride cymbal dance. It's, there's hi-hat chicken away under there too. But now the cymbals are just filling in the space between the kick and the snare without swelling back up. It's a great effect. Somewhere between that crazy slow pumping and this more flickering dancing thing there's other forms of swing. You can really tune the way the cymbals are kind of doing this thing here. It just opens up a world of possibilities for you in terms of groove management. All right, so one more thing on release. I'd like to talk about release as a texture control. And specifically, I hear faster releases as brighter and more aggressive forms of distortion. So it's less about pumping and it's more about growl. And conversely, slowing the release up makes the sound literally a little darker and smoother, and it makes the compression feel more relaxed. And so those are colors that I will use all the time, especially on drums and on vocals as well. Uh, let's get in here for that. Right, so I'm gonna turn things up now because we're focusing more on the back end of the sound rather than the front end. So what I hear now on the drums is I hear a bright ride cymbal and a growling kick. Like, boom, boom. And I hear a bright kind of splatting snare. Those three things will change with the release. kick drum now has lost a lot of that whoa sound and it just sounds more flappy. The snare sounds faster. It sounds tighter compared to here. Different envelope. And the ride symbol is it's less bright. It's also more diffuse and spread out. That ride symbol here sounds more like a ding 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 ding. This is more individual hits on the ride. It's more of a smooth wash. So, ah, release. So near and dear to my heart. And that is how to hear compression on drums. You've got an attack control, which gives you phenomenal control over the transient and therefore the toughness and the punch, drawing your attention to the drummer hitting the drum versus the drum sounding out in the room, a hard and aggressive punchy thick sound versus a fast, soft kind of smushy sound. Over on the release side, you've got a tremendous amount of control over the movement of the compression. If it's a fast, flickering, kind of crunchy, distorted sound, or if it's a slower, more mellow, kind of dancing, swimming sound, you have all these possibilities. And then when you start to blend them in parallel, you get sort of a universe opens up to you in terms of the colors and the textures that compression offers. So getting beyond just simple squashing a signal or holding a vocal in place or gluing things together, 
you start to think of compression as texture and vibe and movement, you get into compression more as an art form, as a way to manage density and transient and movement. That's when things really start to get fun with compressors. But before you can do that, you got to learn how to hear it. And hopefully this exercise has tuned your ears a little better, that kind of thing, and giving you some direction for your own productions. So thanks for watching. My name is Gregory Scott. This has been Kush After Hours. We'll see you soon.